Hey, Jason, welcome to the show. Thanks, thanks for coming. Well, thanks for having me. It's hey, my, my pleasure. You know, the, the more uh, military personnel we can get, the better. And you and I talked uh, pre-show, and it was very interesting, some of the stuff you were saying, because uh, a submarine, while still in the U.S. Navy, it handles itself somewhat differently than uh, what you call target ships, target, you know, the surface crew. So right. uh, what, when you were listening to the show, what, uh, what was... What was on your head? What was on your mind? Well, I, I've, I've been looking into this for a little bit. Like I was telling you uh, about how uh, I, I kind of, I think it was uh, a, a Rob Skiba was doing an interview mm -hmm. on some other show. And uh, the host talked about having to watch one of his videos prior to listening to the show to understand it better. Mm -hmm. So I watched his video and then I went down the rabbit hole from there. Okay. Uh, it got really interesting. Uh, you know, because I was like, like you guys have described a lot of other people. Uh, this is crazy. This is nuts. You know? <laughs> and I, to be honest with you, I'm not even sure what I'm doing here right now. <laughs> right? I, you, you would not be alone. Jonathan and I say that every week. Yeah. And, and not only did that happen, but I was looking into it for, on a, for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. and, and I happened to call one of my younger brothers and. So we're talking about some stuff, and I tell him, hey, man, listen, I, I want to ask you about something. And I don't think I'm crazy, but have, have you looked into this, this flat earth issue that's like going on? He's like, and he was telling me, oh, no, dude, well, who, who, who you been talking to? Because he thought I, I had had a conversation with our other, my other younger brother, because the two of them were talking about it already before I even knew about it. And uh, it turns out the three of us at the same time during a two, three week span kind of discovered the, this whole flat earth thing at the same time without either of us even knowing it. Freaky. Nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that was kind of freaky. And then, uh, you know, I kept on, you know, trying to look for more information, you know, like a lot of people just trying to debunk it because this is crazy. This is crazy talk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I have an open mind. Yeah. So, uh, then when we're, I was listening to your show that, uh, with Robert, the sailor guy. Yep. Uh, he was talking about uh, uh, his weapon system, and I think he brought up the, the gyro compasses and the accelerometers and things like that, and it just got me to thinking. And then the, the line of sight with the lasers. Mm -hmm. And it got me to thinking the way we drove the submarines around under the water. Yeah. And, okay, and it really, did, it really has nothing to do with the shape of the Earth when you think about the submarine. Because we drive based on depth, all right? Yeah. So regardless of what the shape of the bottom of the ocean is, it doesn't matter. But mainstream science claims, what about the surface of the ocean? Yeah. That it follows the curve of the globe. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a submarine underwater, and what we would do is uh, when we're driving, every six hours you would do uh, what we call trimming the ship. And you'd log it in, in a book. Uh, what that means, you've got uh, you know, anywhere from a 380 to a 600 foot long tube. Mm -hmm. all right? And there's uh, weights are distributed all about. People are moving around. You'd have to move water around in all these different tanks. We call them ballast tanks. Okay. To level out the ship. The trim of it, fore and aft the roll side to side so that it runs smoothly and straight through the water on depth mm -hmm. at a certain speed. So uh, we would go ahead and trim the ship and we would try to trim it to where you would have your control surfaces like an airplane. You've got your front wings, your, your back uh, uh, stabilizers and all that on an airplane. Same thing on a submarine. Mm -hmm. So we would trim it to the point where we would go a certain speed with our control surfaces at zero angle with the, uh, the angle of the ship on a zero angle where a bubble is zero, like a plane would be level on the horizon. Mm -hmm. Submarine's bubble would be zero. And we would get, we would try to get exactly to that point where everything would be zero and you could maintain depth at that speed without touching anything. Okay. All right. And it's, it sometimes it's difficult. Uh, sometimes it's pretty easy. I'm not saying you can drive around for hours like that without having to make adjustments because people move around. You got to move water and things like that. Yeah. See, under the water is kind of like 
up in the air also. You have different uh, layers. Uh, I, I went up in a plane just on Tuesday. Uh, mm -hmm. Took a little private flight on a Cessna 172 because I hadn't been on a plane since 1996. I wanted to go up in a plane and see how far I could look on the horizon. Mm -hmm. So I went up in a little Cessna 172 for about an hour. Uh, uh, the highest speed one was about 3,000. Uh, but you go through layers, uh, different temperature layers, the clouds and stuff like that. Same thing in the water. Under the water, you have different uh, temperature layers. And uh, depending on the temperature of the water, the, the buoyancy of the submarine can be heavier or uh, lighter, depending on the water temperature. So you could have a pocket and all of a sudden feel light or heavy. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't shift like an airplane, like you get turbulence. It's kind of the same thing, but it's much more subtle. You don't really feel it. But because uh, it takes a long time for the uh, the buoyancy of the submarine to change, it could take thirty minutes, an hour, for okay. the field effects of it. But if you get your submarine on depth, let's just pick a, a depth of two hundred feet, zero bubble, at a certain speed, control surface is zero. It's not going to take you very long to notice that you're going to be going off depth because now now your reference is the surface of the water. Nothing to do with the uh, the bottom of the ocean. Okay. References the surface of the water, according to mainstream science, has a curve to it. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so if you're at 200 feet, maintaining control surface is zero. And and we, we, can, main we can maintain depth within one-tenth of a foot on a submarine. Okay. So our instruments, we have digital readout. If you're at 200 feet, if you go to 199.9, you're going to know it. After a while, it's not going to take you that long before you're poking your nose out of the surface of, uh, of the ocean. Because, but, it, it, because if it's curved, the, the calculations, it, the, the sub is going to want to go up. It's, na it's naturally going to go up. Yeah, because it's, it's just driving through the water. Yeah. It, it's, uh, it only maintains depth by how we control it. It doesn't do it on its own. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's just this, this – it's like taking a pencil. If you just took a pencil – Imagine you're holding this pencil in the ocean. You're you're a huge giant, okay? <laughs> you're holding a pencil in the ocean, and you're pushing it straight across, yeah, completely straight. After a while, the tip of that pencil is going to come out of the curve of the ocean. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Because you're not maintaining depth. You're just you have your control surface is zero. Your bubble your bubble is zero, and after a while, you're going to run out of just you're just going to run out of curve. And I don't know if I don't know if people can understand how I'm saying that. Can you guys understand that? Yeah, yeah, because this is the this is the argument the airplane uh, the airplane argument, exactly. and that is <clears throat> if the airplane because submarines are really just airplanes in the ocean, like you like you had said, mm -hmm. and if the airplane stays level, if it tries to stay level, eventually the curve is going to drop down below them, and it's just going to keep increasing altitude. And if they had infinite power, they would escape the uh, the orbit of the Earth. And, and, and we were doing that at 172. I, I, actually, I was actually flying it for about 10 minutes. Yeah. And uh, uh, we're, we're going along. Yeah. And uh, we're, we're at about 1,000 feet. Mm -hmm. We're actually over the ocean, just right off the shoreline. Mm -hmm. And uh, everything's flat for the ice for as far as you can see. I think according to calculations, I was able to see about 67 miles out. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the, the tape that I took. And I'm going to try to pick any uh, uh, landmarks that are 67 miles out on a map. Let's mm -hmm. see if I can actually see them on the tape. Okay. But uh, what I noticed was uh, we were doing about 100, uh, 100 miles per hour. And he had the, uh, the uh, what do you call them, uh, the elevators. You can lock in the, the rear elevators on the airplane at a certain angle to maintain your altitude. Okay. Consistent. All right, and that's okay. what we were doing. All, all we were basically doing was moving the stick to fight the the crosswinds. But we yeah. were flying along without nudging the nose down, nudging the nose up, or nothing like that. Yeah, for for a long time, I, I'd say at least minutes and minutes, and we we're maintaining our altitude within about ten feet. Yeah, it was just a little bit of turbulence, <laughs> you know, making us go up and down a little bit. But yeah. uh, we weren't fighting altitude; we we're just flat as a pancake. So and I, I've, ta I've talked to no less than uh, four pilots. The, the guy that I talked to on the Cessna 172, the guy that was on the ground in the lobby, 
uh, I have two neighbors. Uh, one of them was a uh, pilot in the Marine Corps for 20 years, and he flew for a uh, commercial, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, packages. One of those you, companies. You- Hey, can, hey, you were breaking up there for a second. Can you repeat that last 10 seconds? Okay. He, uh, he flew for the Marine Corps for 20 years, and he also flew for a, uh, a commercial carrier for 10 years. It was at least 10 years. And uh, when I asked him about uh, how do you guys compensate for gravity and how do you compensate for curvature of the Earth, he didn't know how to answer because nobody's ever asked that before. And, and they don't compensate for gravity. I've never met a pilot yet that can tell me how they compensate for gravity. Because, I mean, you're talking about the the strongest, te- you know, basically the strongest force that's created by the planet, supposedly. But not a single person who flies above the ground or has to maintain buoyancy in the water considers gravity at all when they have to do their job doing that. Yeah, I did uh, missions from uh, close to the North Pole under the ice to uh, uh, drug, drug interdiction stuff down in the uh, Caribbean Ocean. Okay. Okay. And, but I don't, I have never met, the whole time I was in, I never met anybody that ever did any kind of ops down in the, uh, the South Atlantic or the South Pacific. Closer Seriously. to, closer to the Arct- uh, Antarctica. Seriously. Yeah. I, I, I can't think of anybody who's ever done anything like that because hmm. you would have thought that would have come up in conversation at least once you know it's just like oh yeah where, where'd you been i mean because if you say the furthest south you went was what the caribbean uh well, north, just 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 north of south america you the know equa- uh, the equator it's about the, okay but but you didn't uh, but but no you didn't spend any time in the south atlantic the south pacific the indian Well, wait. When you say you don't mean you don't mean anybody, you don't. You just I, talk. You're just I, talking I, about submarines. Yes, yeah, submarines. Yeah, I don't know of anybody on a submarine who's did patrols south of the uh, south of the equator. So wait, wait, wait. In general, submarines don't go below. Well, I you know I don't know. I just don't know of anybody. I never did, and I don't know of anybody that ever <laughs> did. Anything. All right, which which map are we referring to here when you say south of the equator? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean it, either one. Either one. I mean, so so in 20 years, and you seem like a fairly social guy, uh, never, no, nobody nobody seemed to, you didn't run into me. It's like, yeah, we, we went down to, uh, you know, we, we did the horn, you know, Cape Horn. Right, yeah, that would make sense. Or we went off South Africa or went off anywhere down there. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure somebody has done that. Well, I don't know why anybody would do the horn. Huh. Now, that's interesting. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. So, oh, I'm sorry. Just so we have everybody on the same page here, um, uh, Robert is a uh, um, Sea Sparrow missile instructor, uh, served on the Iwo Jima, and Jason has uh, done served on five nuclear um, submarines from 1988 to 2008. You got out in 2008 and uh, listened to our show the other night uh, with with you, Robert, and now he's saying, you know what, he may be onto something. So I'm sorry. So what was your quick story, Jason? Oh, I was, was going to say I've done several uh, several different training exercises where we would have a uh, anti-submarine warfare group, and uh, they have to practice going around trying to chase submarines and find them and all that kind of stuff. And when you do that, you're given a a, a strict set of waypoints, a track that you have to follow and run along. And all different ships have their areas that they're going to drive around and try to find the submarine, right? And, and, and in part of the exercise, it would tell us, you know, us the submarine, that when you get to a certain waypoint, go to a certain depth, and at a certain time, we would, we would ha- it would be in the instructions. This is what we had to do. At a certain time, we would have to beat on the hull with a hammer to make noise to try to help the ships find us. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. So if, if without us beating on the, the hole with a hammer, there's no way they could ever find it. So just so we're clear, let's let's recap so far. So a submarine treats um, treats the water much like an airplane. Uh, it elevates, you know, it declines. And you're saying with the systems on board, it, it basically if 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 the world is truly round, 
you guys, the, the systems you've got are going to just keep pushing you towards the surface until you do surface, which is the, which is the equivalent of uh, an airplane leaving, leaving the, uh, the Earth's atmosphere. Exactly. Wow. Well, we'll put it this way. The, uh, the navigation systems on board a submarine, uh, we could, and th- this happened to us a few times, when you're on station, you're doing some secret school stuff, and what you would do every day at least once a day, usually twice a day, you would go to periscope depth, yeah. up up an antenna, and get a GPS fix, which means it'll tell you, hey, you know, you connect to a bunch of satellites from what they tell me. Uh, and uh, I mean, looking back, I'm like, well, that's one of the questions I have about how does that stuff really work out in the middle of the ocean? But I did do some research and remind me about that too, okay? Okay. Uh, with... Uh, and you just go up and get a, you're up there for maybe five minutes. You get a GPS fix, downloaded it into the system electronically, and boom, you go back down. Sometimes we wouldn't be able to do that for a couple of weeks. And we would be within 200 yards of where we thought we were going to be. Hmm. But you were tr- still trying to confirm with the GPS system. Although, since, and this actually confirms what we already knew, which was if you never did a submission above or below the equator, and that's where the systems drop off, then whatever it, you know, I still believe. I still firmly believe that the GPS system is not sky based, or it's only partially sky based. Uh, you know, using a, a, comp- a go I did ahead some research into that. Okay, and, uh, there's a system called Loran. Have you ever heard of it? I have heard of it. Yeah, people have mentioned this uh, one to me. Long range navigation, I think, is what it stands for. Mm-hmm. And supposedly, it, I don't even think it's supposed to be even in use anymore. But the Loran system, uh, from the advertised specs, what they tell us the capabilities are, we're able to uh, project a signal 1,500 nautical miles. So wow. if you have uh, Loran stations on either side of the Atlantic Ocean, you're, you're hitting the middle of the ocean. Sure. You're in the middle of the ocean. And, you know, that's the advertised range. You know, who knows what the... You know. Exactly. Yeah, like two two way radios. They say, "Oh, yeah, we can do fifty miles," but that's under completely optimum conditions. Right. So, right. for all so, we know, hey, the the military capability could be four thousand miles. We don't know. Could, maybe, but but at the same time, wouldn't you want to use that to your advantage in the southern hemisphere? Meaning, why does the GPS system drop all the planes? And people have rattled off all sorts of fun excuses to me. But why do the planes drop off about 150, 200 miles offshore and go to estimated or approximate mode? And this, then they literally drop off the screen. There's actually a lot of questions I have, and I want to put it out there because there's probably people smarter than I am who can maybe figure these things out. But I have some questions I want to ask. Okay? Sure. Robert, you might know about this. Uh, you're familiar with gyros- gyroscopic, pre- gyroscopic precession, right? The laws of precession. I, okay. I am. I was actually talking to Mark about that uh, yesterday. Okay, now we're supposedly on a big ass gyro compass, mm-hmm. spinning at 1,100 miles per hour at, at its outermost edge. Yeah. Right. And we're on this uh, elliptical orbit around the sun. Yep. Okay. Now, what force? Is causing now? Well, you know, the mainstream science says the gravity of the sun is causing us to be in that elliptical orbit, right? Mm-hmm. Now, I want to know how the force of that gravity being placed on this gyroscope that we call the spinning globe of Earth. Why is it that those forces are not affecting? us spinning like the laws of precession affect every other gyroscope that's been. I agree. I, I actually know where you're going with this um, because for anyone that doesn't know about gyros, you can go look this up, but uh, gyroscopes, once they're spun up, their centrifugal force acts as kind of like an anti-gravity uh, precession. Like they like to stay in whatever orientation they were whenever they're spun up to a certain RPM. All right. Um, and I get where you're going with that because uh, if we're supposedly affected by the same amount of gravity that keeps our Earth in orbit around an elliptical pattern, 
then why isn't it why doesn't the sun throw all of our instruments off that we supposedly use and if a gyroscope uh, we can actually see it work in you know natural space that's what we use as instruments for aircraft ships all that stuff our our world is just like a big gyroscope